rice is one of mankind's major staple foods. Over the past millennia, religions, cultures, and arts germinated in Asia have been disseminated alongside the seed of the plants, creating a distinct cultural and social landscape. The rice seeds traveled across mountains and seas, growing lavishly where conditions permitted. Nowadays, rice is not only the basic foodstuff for over 60% of the global population, but has been adapted to different customs and beliefs, global commerce, and multinational integration. From prehistoric times to today, these stories, told from various perspectives, have shaped human civilization. The roads rice has traveled will allow us to explore the hidden human stories behind this seemingly simple grain. Why did Chinese people cultivate rice? It might be one of the most crucial questions in human history. For what reason did ancient people gradually abandon a nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle and become farmers tied to the land for their entire lives? The beginning of the story might be found in a cave in southern China. In 1993, a Sino-American archaeological team came here. Their arrival turned the small hill, only a dozen or so meters high, into a huge peak in human development. The discovery of two apparently mundane pieces of fossil, samples of rice grain from 12,000 years ago, gives us our earliest clues. Not far from these two fossils, in a cave 10 kilometers away, two teeth from a specimen of Homo sapiens dated to 120,000 years ago were further discovered. In 1,000 kilometers away, in the Immortals Cave at Wanyin County in Jiangxi Province, a rice phytolith, also dated to 12,000 years ago, was discovered. The two fossils seem to confirm that early men consuming rice as a staple first appeared in the Yangtze River region and further south. But these rice fossils do not correlate with other known human activities from the period. So archaeologists have yet to certify whether the rice was deliberately cultivated or simply gathered opportunistically. 
实际上，在中国的很多地方，我们都看到了最早的人尝试利用盗作资源的这样一些证据。所谓的尝试利用，就是我不能够决定是不是这些证据足以证明它发展出了盗作农业，我也不能够决定发现的那些考古学的倒数的遗存已经全部都是驯化种。啊，这两个点，现在考古证据都不是完全百分之百认定的。但是在人在食物资源短缺的情况下，他如果也能够发现这个野生的在身边那个存在的话，应该说他也会迫使他去利用。If ancient people simply gathered and ate wild rice, this can't be the origin of paddy cultivation. The fine grains we see today are the result of persistent human efforts towards acclimatization. 我们从生物学上讲，野生稻在被驯化之前就已经广泛的分布在整个这个从非洲一直到亚洲的这个各个地方。我们说水稻起源是说是什么时候被驯化的？是被人类开始把它变成从一个野生种变成一个人工的栽培种，我们叫它这个叫起源。Wheat was first cultivated in the fertile lands of Mesopotamia in West Asia about 10,000 years ago. It now forms mankind's second largest cereal crop, after rice. The acclimatization and spread of rice demonstrates a remarkable survival project as evidenced by contemporary archaeology, but much more of the story still lies in obscurity. In the southwest of Fujian province, there stand many unusual buildings. They are colossal and of unique design. These are the Hakatulo, or Earth Towers, frequently circular in shape. Rice is planted around them, and the grain is the staple of the locals. They have also discovered new uses for their rice. Born in this building, Su Hung Gray, in his late 50s, is deeply attached to the fate of the two low. We are not going to be able to do it. If the child is a child, we will be able to do it. 你的包一些还在我们土楼，以后落叶归根要找包一些。The Hakka bury the placenta or afterbirth of the newborn under the castle-like too low, attaching the child's destiny to the dwelling. Whenever Su Hung Gray returns to the remains of this building, which had been destroyed by gunfire in the 1930s, he can smell the scent of rice. We have a big room that is open. A hundred rooms are up to 40 rooms. It's a high room. One room is to eat and eat. The second room is to eat and eat. The third room is to eat and eat. 
once took part in the excavation of Shangshan relics in Zhejiang province. Two rice grains dated to 10,000 years ago were found there. Unlike the relics of single paddy cultivation in Hunan and Jiangxi, in Zhejiang, rice husks were found in pottery ware, seemingly a deliberate form of storage. Beyond that, a large amount of carbonized rice husks were also found in the earth used for construction. Tongu 是人类采集的，但是不管采，不管是哪一种方式，说明了距今一万年以前的上山古代先民与稻谷的关系非常密切。The weather in Fujian is hot and humid. The topsoil is shallow. Besides its productivity, rice had other advantages. When the Hakka people migrated to Fujian in the Qing Han era, self-defense and defensive buildings were a paramount need. In a region short of solid materials, everything had to be explored. Rice was one such material. Experts assume that when building the Tulo, Hakka people added rice husks and rice milk into the soil, with which they constructed the wall and double tamped it, making it as strong as concrete. The heavy earthen walls made the buildings like impregnable fortresses, a sanctuary for whole clans of migrants. Throughout history, many tombs in China were constructed with hardening materials, like rice husks and rice milk. In ancient times, this building technique was widely used to strengthen structures. But the exact nature of the mix was for long a mystery, giving rise to many hypotheses and legends. But those long-standing structures prove one thing for sure. The mixture of rice husks and rice milk with other materials was effective. Wild rice over 1.5 million years ago was widely dispersed across present-day Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Oceania but it first became a dietary item for populations living in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River 10,000 years ago. From then on, it ceased to be a wild riverine weed and became an important cultivated crop around ancient Chinese settlements. Zhuo Jiang's Shangshan relics show that the early cultivators of the plant had a full appreciation of its value and not just as a food item. Rice grows prolifically in China's warm south, but in the Yellow River Basin, where the climate is drier, 
humans living there 9,000 years ago created another miracle. Yan Zhao Sheng used to believe his destiny was tied to the yellow earth, but he still felt that one day he would find another calling. Finally, he found it in a grain of rice. So you have to forget your own mind. 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 Ian has to prepare himself with a prolonged period of relaxation before he can get to work. His new calling is rice carving. To say the work is extremely delicate is an understatement. He aims to carve dozens of Chinese characters onto a single grain. Once he starts carving, he needs to hold his breath throughout the process until the work is finished. Today, he will carve the 20 characters of a Tang Dynasty poem onto the grain's tiny surface. If the grains of today were as small as those of thousands of years ago, it would be an impossible task, even with his specially designed tools. So where do the large grains we see today come from? Central China is seen as the origin of early Chinese civilization. In particular, the Jiahu culture, found in Henan's Fuyang County, is hailed as the threshold between barbarism and civilization. Jia Cheng Yo used to be an ordinary farmer in Fuyang County. Today, he has become an archaeologist responsible for discovering stories hidden below the earth. 30 years ago, Jia Cheng Yo and his friends witnessed an important discovery. These are the 9,000-year-old rice fossils, by far the earliest traces of rice found in the Yellow River Basin. Compared with the ones discovered at Shengshan in Zhejiang, the ones from Henan are larger and seem more nutritious. Why is the Henan grain bigger when the growing conditions further north are less suitable and the temperatures lower? It seems that 9,000 years ago, the climate in Jiahu was temperate and humid, with a temperature five degrees Celsius higher than today's, making it suitable for wild rice. Ancient peoples in Jiahu might have begun domesticating wild rice and keeping back the largest grains with a view to the next year's sowing. Year after year, the bigger grains were selected. And if that continued, Jia Ho would have been the first place where rice was cultivated on a large scale. But it ceased all of a sudden. Apart from these fossils, the era of rice cultivation in central China left us with no other traces.
This seven-hole bone flute survives from that time. Its range covers all seven scales, and it is by far the earliest wind instrument in the world. Historically, such artistic attainment is usually based on a high level of material civilization. It can be inferred that people in the Jahu area 9,000 years ago were living an affluent and settled life. If their civilization hadn't disappeared, China's history might have been very different. History allows no such speculations. Based on current discoveries, wild animals and plants account for the majority of the food types found in Jiahu. Rice is just a small proportion. Dao 零星的这些古人在利用稻作Maybe climate change caused water scarcity in northern China, prohibiting the continuation of rice cultivation. While in the warm south, this small crop from the hunter-gatherer era entered onto the stage of human existence. This is a sound from 6,000 years ago. The sound comes from the bone flute made by Ni Yue Hui from an animal shank. By adjusting the airflow, the bone flute creates its otherworldly sound. The original bone flute, dating from 6,000 years ago, is now exhibited in the Humudu Site Museum. Unlike the seven-hole bone flute excavated at Jiahu, this one is assumed to be an instrument for attracting wild animals. But such a conclusion can't be definite without correlated evidence. Looking around, it's easy to find a series of facts. A few meters from the bone flute exhibit, there are some black particles sealed in a glass vessel. These are the rice grains from 7,000 years ago. Along with them, 
170 pieces of an ancient spade-shaped farm tool were excavated here. In addition, at the Humu Du site, there are plenty of rice fossils as well. Sun Guoping is in charge of the Tian Shan relic site, located just seven kilometers away from the Humu Du site. Its culture is almost contemporaneous with Humu Du's. Large amounts of rice grain fossils have also been discovered here. Sun Guoping speculates that the rice yield at Tian Luo Shan was quite substantial. The various excavated pieces such as rice grains, farming tools, and cooking utensils present us with the fact that the He Mudu people included dehusked rice in their diet and were proficient rice planters. Why did the earliest paddy agriculture originate in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River from around Humudu? Tai 这两种不同的生态环境背景。第二个原因呢，就是当地有栽培稻的野生祖本、野生稻。Zhuo Province is one of the crucibles of Chinese culture. The Ningxiao Plain, where the Humudu site is located, is a major rice-producing area. Moreover, the processing of rice has long been a refined skill of the locals. After one day's work, the rice will become a different substance. Rice powder is sifted into a customized wooden frame. Square spaces are carved out with a special tool. These spaces are then filled with red bean paste. Then another layer of rice powder is sifted on the top. And after that, a wooden stamp is primed with red rice powder to provide the decorative red seals. Then, after steaming for 15 minutes, the Liang Non rice cakes are ready. The fine processing of rice is part of the daily routine for people in the Yangtze River Delta. Huang Guosheng and his wife have been serving up this local delicacy for years. A large number of game animal and plant fossils were excavated from the two relic sites. This shows that in Humudu culture, paddy agriculture had yet to fully replace the hunter-gatherer lifestyle.
稻米的这种形态特征来观察的话，呃，河姆渡文化时期的稻米还是具有一定的野生的性状。另外一个就是从整个历史长河的这种呃驯化过程来看的话，到了河姆渡时期，这个驯化的过程，就是水稻在中国南方地区驯化的过程还没有最终完成。田螺山遗址和河姆渡遗址，他们所提供的。大量的考古的实物证据，为我们探讨当时人类的生业形态，它仍然处在由采集狩猎社会向稻作农业社会的转变的过程之中。啊，啊，这个意义就很重大了，证实了稻作农业起源是一个缓慢的演变过程的这个理论。It remains unknown whether the bone flute from 7,000 years ago sounds the same as today, but rice undoubtedly helped sustain the once flourishing Humudu civilization. Experts further speculate that the bone flute might have been made for entertainment, as art is normally an offshoot of a prosperous society. These discoveries have made Humudu a significant landmark in prehistorical agrarian civilization. The warm, humid, and sunny areas of South China are well suited for growing rice. However, these archaeological discoveries are not in these regions ideally suited to rice cultivation. Why is it that agrarian societies didn't develop first in the warm, humid tropical zones, but instead further north in the middle and lower reaches of the Yangtze River? Guangxi Zhuan Autonomous Region lies in southwestern China. Around 6,000 years ago, local people began cultivating rice here. This advent of human planted rice was 1,000 years later than the Humudu area, but the area enjoyed abundant growth in vegetation. The local Zhuang ethnic group has preserved many distant memories of old traditions. In Tunli village of Napo County, located in the western mountains of Guangxi, local people venerate the color black. They are often called the Black Zhuang. As a girl approaches adulthood, her mother will prepare the most important gift for her and tell her the story of their ancestors. The black clothes are dyed with indigo because this herb, once cured wounded soldiers in ancient times, is believed to have kept their people safe and prosperous. To the black Zhuang, dark indigo is the symbol of perseverance and courage. If black relates to ancient legend, then this necktie with a pair of fish and ripples indicates hope. Their significance is manifested in the engraved tokens on their personal belongings. These legends have been carefully preserved for thousands of years. They must commemorate something. The Zhuang have cultivated rice for thousands of years, living hand to hand with this precious foodstuff. Today, the black Zhuang live in a place starved of water. Rice has become scarce, but their legends of transforming into fish relates to a time of an abundance of water and paddy fields.
These ornaments remind us that 6,000 years ago, in the warmth of South China, all kinds of plants flourished in the subtropical climate, including rice.就是是在富足的条件下才会产生农业还是在压力的条件下才会产生农业的问题我个人觉得也不完全是压力我在一开始栽培和利用学会这个使用到做资源的同时呢我还是在利用大量的野生的资源我还是在吃巷子我还是在
It takes much effort for the people of Huang Gang Dong village to set a bowl of rice onto their tables. Many animals gather and store seeds for food, but as far as we can tell, only humans deliberately plant crops. The water content of harvested rice is too high to allow processing. For that, the Dong built a tall granary to speed the drying, while a pool at the bottom keeps out rats. The pool is also used to raise fish fry, which, when grown large enough, will be transferred to the paddy. The rich environment in the paddy provides nutrition for the fish. Thus, at harvest time, rice and fish are both on the menu. The Dong live largely in the mountains of Guizhou, where arable land is scarce. So they try every means to make the best use of the available land. Careful planning and such a well-worked system may be one of man's greatest inventions. In 1992, a Sino-Japanese archaeological team excavated a site called Straw Sandal Hill in a suburb of Suzhou. The remains are from the Mahjong Bang culture, which existed 6,000 years ago. The site revealed what was by far one of the earliest paddy relics. The creation of paddy is a key moment in the acclimatization of rice. So,水田是一个很重要的契机,因为我把它分开了,人可以更好地观察它,利用它,培育它,加速它的这个从各种方面的性状往今天的这个成熟的驯化的精道发展的这个方向。The grain and stem of the dried rice separate easily when ground with a pestle. The grain is dehusked in a water-powered stone mill. Finally, the six months of labor yields fruit. The boiled sticky rice is soft and appetizing. Before industrialization, finely polished blades and cumbersome pestles and stone mills were the simplest and most efficient tools of production. Tried and tested farming tools and a stable ecosystem freed people from nomadism. After three generations, the people of Huanggang Dong village could intermarry, which suggests that the development of farming promotes long-term social stability. These are the stone sickle and plow excavated in the Songxi relic site in Shanghai. They belong to the later period of Ma Jiangbang culture. 
当我们看到实例的时候，它跟后来的这个离化系统，就是田间的这个耕作系统是一脉相承的，啊、嗯，所以我们也看到了这个地方随着犁头的越变越大，田块越变越大的这种同步性在长江下游，因为从这个角度，我们才会说松泽时期开始的这个石犁的传统，以及跟它配套的这个特殊的镰刀的传统，是一个非常好的一个农业经济的一个工具套的起源。The appearance of plough and sickle marked the maturity of large-scale paddy cultivation. Rice ceased to be a product cropped from the wild and became a stable food source. In the production of rice, it has many changes. 而其中最关键的改变，就是逐渐的变成由自然落力到成熟后不落力，因为它只有成熟后不落力，才能够保证人类在稻谷成熟季节能够百分之百的收获到它的劳动所得。Six thousand years ago. In the era of prehistory, paddy fields and their corresponding farming tools drove the development of early intensive agriculture. The range of rice cultivation enlarged and yields soared. In the Liangzhu period, rice was acclimatized into the present-day form of Asian cultivated rice. This productive rice-based agriculture allowed human society to move away from a hunter-gatherer society and enter a more advanced agrarian economy. This led to a great change in human society. The accumulation of food and wealth caused social differentiation, leading in turn greater rules of social order and social control. Today, the rice which originated on the banks of the Yangtze has gone through thousands of years of acclimatization and dispersal. The process was part of an epic human struggle for survival. Favored by man, rice expanded its territory like willow catkins, becoming one of the most widely distributed plants on the planet. The popularization of rice is a key step in social evolution. The vast East Asian continent has seen many changes over the past thousands of years as paddy agriculture spread north and west. In doing so, it shaped the unique paddy civilization of China and exerted its influence on every corner of the world.